It's the Miracle Man, Brian Himes. You've seen him perform True Miracles. Miracle number one. Somehow he was the only unpopular reviewer on a site full of popular reviewers. Miracle number two. He reviews comic books, reacts to TV shows, and riffs on old educational shorts. That's right, he spread too thin and still hasn't found an audience. Miracle number three, his love life. Uh, okay, that's, that's enough. This just seems a little mean. Hey, if I performed three miracles, does that make me a saint? Yeah, Saint Bernard. Woof. Enjoy the show. That'll be the real miracle. Back to comic book issues. I'm your host, Brian Hines. Hey, before we get started with this review, please like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and please check out my Patreon page. It's the patrons there who help these videos get made. In fact, it was a patron who pledged to have this very review done. So if you like what you see, please check it out. So what can be said about Alan Moore that hasn't already been said about the angry man down the street screaming at kids to get off his lawn? Except the lawn isn't grass, it's the superhero comic books he's written and no longer wishes to be associated with. He's a polarizing figure in the comics world, but you can't deny his impact. And one of his most famous books he's ever written, although not very well read, is Miracle Man. But that book started out with a different name. In 1953, DC sued Fawcett Comics for publishing reprints of Captain Marvel, now a DC property. Rather than lose a comic, they replaced it with Marvel Man, a carbon copy of the Marvel family. The comic lasted 350-odd issues over the course of 13 years. In the early 80s, publisher Des Skin put out a new anthology book in Britain called Warrior. One of the comics he wanted to include? Marvel Man. The only one he could find interested in writing it? A young lad named Alan Moore. The series, a darker take on the Shazam archetype, lasted for 21 issues, before Moore departed over a pay rate dispute with Skin. Around this time, Marvel Comics sued the publisher Eclipse over using Marvel in the title. So in reprints, you can see very obviously where the name was changed to Miracle Man. The character came back for a sequel series written by a young Neil Gaiman that lasted from 1990 to 1994 when Eclipse went bankrupt. The character remained in limbo as Neil Gaiman, Todd McFarlane, and even original Marvel Man creator Mick Anglo fought over the rights to the character, with Anglo eventually being proven the proper owner. During this time, there were no reprints of these stories, but the legend grew as the final battle between Miracle Man and his former protege turned villain Kid Miracle Man regularly appeared in Wizard Magazine and website lists as one of the greatest superhero stories of all time. In 2009, Marvel purchased the rights to Miracle Man, reprinting the Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman stories. However, due to unforeseen legal circumstances, no new material was being produced. Until now, when the Kang-centric one-shot Timeless hinted that Miracle Man was finally making his way to the Marvel Universe. Well, that's the past, present, and a bit of the future of Miracle Man. Yes, arguably a clone of Billy Batson and the Marvel family, but one reimagined into one of the darkest superhero books of all time. And while we're not going to cover the eventual second battle between Miracle Man and Kid Miracle Man, today we'll at least show you how that started. As I review the first 12 chapters of Miracle Man, later reprinted as the first three issues, A Dream of Flying. In 1981, the Science Gestapo heads back to 1956 to use their superior firepower on the past and conquer the world. Explosive landing catches the eye of young Johnny Bates. The evildoers use their weapons on some dumb farmers Johnny has seen enough and shouts, Miracle Man, becoming his alternate self, Kid Miracle Man. Their weapons are useless against him, but he realizes he'll soon be overwhelmed by their numbers and gets help. Dickie Dauntless, a.k.a. Young Miracle Man. However, after hours of combat, they're still no closer to stemming the tide. They grab a soldier who explains that their future tech makes him invulnerable and unstoppable. Even now, they're conquering every major city on Earth. Finally, Mickey Moran, copy boy, sees the story in the paper, transforming into Miracle Man. The leader of the Science Gestapo orders his time ships destroyed, so they can't go home. Leaving Kid behind to hold off the bad guys, young and adult Miracle Man use atomic speed to fly into the future. Arriving the day before they departed, they destroy the Chrono Cruisers and turn the bad guys over to the future Fuzz. In the present, a shocked Kid Miracle Man sees his foes disappear before his very eyes. As Miracle Man's smile closes out the first issue, we get a Nietzsche quote. Behold, I teach you the Superman. He is the lightning. He is the madness. Ah, you just can't beat Nietzsche for good old gangster rap lyrics. Give me a beat, yo. No. <clears throat> All right, I'll freestyle it. 
Behold, I teach you the Superman. He is the lightning. He is the madness. Taught me to jump over every hurdle. Then got stuck for an hour on today's wordle. Mic drop. Yo. Your new vanilla ice. <laughs> Issue two is a significant change. Michael Moran is now a grown man, having nightmares about flying. He and his two companions fly into a ship and are enveloped in flame. Waking up in a cold sweat next to his wife Liz, he quickly gets ready to cover a new story as a freelance journalist. On his way to a nuclear testing facility, he tries to remember the strange word from his dreams. At the facility, a group of armed masked men gather the press and head in. They're going to steal plutonium and auction it off to terrorists. They're counting on the press to report this and bring in more bidders. Mike faints, a migraine blasting through his head as he begins to hallucinate. He sees the word and whispers, Kemota. Mike is Miracle Man once again. The nearest terrorist is badly burned by the transformation. His compatriots rush in and fire, but the bullets just bounce off Mike. He slaps his hands together, creating a mini thunderclap. They easily go down, and a jubilant hero celebrates his return after 18 long years away. Liz wakes up to find Miracle Man standing over her. She is naturally a bit freaked out when he claims to be her husband, Mike. He's able to convince her and recounts his origin. As a young boy working for the paper, he encounters Guntag Borghelm, astrophysicist. He's unlocked the power of the universe and gifts it to Mike because of his good nature, granting him an adult body with superpowers when he utters the word Kimota. Liz finds this all a bit ridiculous. Even the real names sound made up. Dickie Dauntless? Johnny Bates? Mike admits it is a bit far-fetched now that he thinks about it, but continues to tell how they fought the monsters of the evil scientist, Dr. Gargunza. But he was never really that evil. It always seemed like more of a contest, neither side trying to win that hard. Liz asks, why hasn't she heard about this all before if it really happened? Maybe because of the eventual outcome. The trio took on the doctor and his mechanical spider ship over the British seas, but too late, they realized it was a trap. Gargunza set off an A-bomb. He saw young Miracle Man die in a fusion of Superman and Man. He himself survived with terrible burns and no memories of his time as Miracle Man until earlier today. In an office, a man sees that Miracle Man has returned. Returned to spoil everything as he smashes his desk. Liz wakes up next to Miracle Man but receives a phone call from Mike. He's shocked to learn it's Mr. Bates, a.k.a. Johnny, a.k.a. Kid Miracle Man. Alive and well, and the president of Sunburst Cybernetics. Mike and Liz join him for lunch. He explains that he tried to fly away from the atomic explosion, but it stripped him of his powers, not his memory. He eventually built Sunburst from the ground up into a multi-million dollar business. Later, when Mike and John are alone, Mike wonders aloud, what if Johnny is lying? What if he never lost his powers? Suddenly alone, the most powerful creature on Earth, he stayed in his atomic form, over time severing his link to his humanity. What if he's still Kid Miracle Man? John denies it, and Mike wonders if his mind has been affected. Liz comes in, breaking the tension, and Mike makes a logical decision to push John off the roof of his building. I'm here for the intern job. Uh, why didn't you ask to meet me on Hoover Dam for an interview, though? I think you're a superhero. With powers like flight and invulnerability. I'm not. <clears throat> ah! <sighs> Wrong again. Oh well. Next! Yeah, he's still got his powers and is totally evil. Mike and Liz book it. John's death threats trailing behind them. He takes a moment to kill his secretary. Disgusted by his cruelty, Mike utters, Kimota, becoming Miracle Man. They battle on the streets. Kid now has 16 more years' experience with their powers than Miracle Man does. He mops the floor with his ex-mentor. A young boy mistakes him for a popular 1980s comic book movie hero of the day. Howard the Duck. What? No. Return of Swamp Thing? No. Oh, the great American hero. You know what? That's enough off-screen voiceover characters for this review. So you're not interested in interviewing me for the internship? Kid Miracle Man offers to take the boy flying and keeps his word, although he stays on the ground. Miracle Man is able to catch him, but the boy is hurt. Trying to hide how afraid he is, Miracle Man gets blasted by a thunderbolt. Kid slams him into the ground at Mach 3. In the rubble, there's no sign of the hero, and there's no stopping the kid. Liz is speeding away from the city, afraid for her life. Kid Miracle Man lands in front of her, and the car wraps around his indestructible form. John lets her know her husband is dead. He crumbles up the car and is about to smash it down on her, when from behind, Miracle Man knocks him into the sky. They trade epic punches and energy beams. As news of the battle spreads further and further up the chain of command, until it reaches Sir Dennis Archer, who recognizes the combatants. He puts out a call 
to Mr. Cream. Miracle Man is getting his butt properly and thoroughly kicked by Kid Miracle Man. Johnny can't help but gloat. He wants the entire world to know that he won the battle. Kid Miracle Man! Whoops. Having said his mentor's name, Kid Miracle Man slips back inside the bottle, as it were. It's the chance Miracle Man needs. He'll have to kill his former sidekick, but instead finds the teenage Johnny Bates. In tears, stuttering and begging to be forgiven. He's been trapped inside Kid Miracle Man this whole time. Miracle Man decides there's nothing more to be done here and leaves with Liz. Elsewhere, a man in a white suit named Evelyn Cream answers the telephone. He's so pleased by the news on the other end that he smiles, revealing sapphires instead of teeth. A very large, imposing man named Evelyn Cream, and somehow he manages to have the least embarrassing name in the entire story. And that's with the character named Johnny Bates. Also, I'd like some credit. Since this entire episode is British, I never once replaced Mr. with Master when I referred to young Mr. Bates. Think about it, and you're welcome. Two months later, and the world is still reeling from the superhuman battle. Mike and Liz drive out into the English countryside. Time to test out his powers and get some answers. Elsewhere, young Johnny Bates is nearly catatonic, but in his mind's eye, Kid Miracle Man is screaming obscenities at him. Miracle Man just better hope that he never gets out again. This theorizes that Miracle Man's invulnerability might be a force field. His super strength? Telekinesis. At a hospital, Mr. Cream arrives and announces he's a burn care specialist, here to check on the terrorist who was burned by Miracle Man's reappearance. Liz's ultimate conclusion is that Mike and Miracle Man share two bodies. When he's Miracle Man, the Mike body is somewhere else and vice versa. That's why the other body didn't age as much. Why Johnny was still a child after being Kid Miracle Man for so long. Oh, and by the way, she's pregnant and Miracle Man is the father. Okay, okay. We've got our superhero in a lead line booth, and the results of the paternity test are in. Is he the father? Let's put up this ultrasound picture. Oh, sweet heavenly God. Mr. Superhero, you are the father, but an alien from another planet, so your hybrid human child is an abomination against all we hold dear, and has challenged every preset notion we hold about inherent decency in the universe. To the terrorist, Cream identifies himself as an intelligence operative. The terrorist eventually fingers Mike as the man who became a god. Cream then kills him. Miracle Man is out flying before transforming back into Mike. Liz wonders why Miracle Man's outfit is no longer damaged following his battle, but Mike really doesn't want to talk about superheroes this morning. Liz knows this is about their baby. Since she told him Mike's been cold. Well, it all comes out. After years of trying, one night with Miracle Man is all it takes to get her pregnant? But why be jealous? The two are one, aren't they? Mike's not so sure. His emotions and feelings are more intense, more pure in his god form. He's not sure if he wants Miracle Man to go away or just to stop being Mike. Though he promises Liz he will get his feelings sorted out. He heads over to the Daily Record paper to see if they have any work for him, unaware Mr. Cream is following him. They're trying to publish articles about the superhuman battle, but the government is clamping down on them to keep it a secret. Unfortunately, there's no work for him right now. In the elevator, a woman asks him to hold her baby while she gets a bottle. But then Mr. Cream is there with the gun. He's not going to transform knowing the energy discharge would roast that baby alive, is he? Cream shoots him twice and he blacks out. We then see Miracle Man walking out of the dark. He's attacked by two ninjas. They fail. Cut to a gagged and tied Mike being held prisoner. Mr. Cream explains that Miracle Man was created by Project Zarathustra, run by a branch of the British Air Force Intelligence code named The Spook Show. They eventually tried to kill him and his friends with an A-bomb. When he resurfaced, Cream was hired to find out who he was and to kill him. Sir Archer and his cohorts now believe that Cream has betrayed them. The name he reported to them for Miracle Man's secret identity has proved to be made up. Flamethrowers have no effect on Miracle Man. Cream wants to understand how they made him. That knowledge could be very valuable. He unties Mike, who transforms. Sir Dennis admits he should have shut down the bunker that created Miracle Man long ago, but kept it operative in the hopes of recouping the fortune spent to create the trio of heroes. As the soldiers fail to stop him, a bomb goes off. Archer isn't too concerned about the soldiers. Best to leave no witnesses to this. But, unscathed, Miracle Man continues to head towards a government bunker. Mr. Cream knows where to find the bunker. Miracle Man agrees to work together for now, and they fly off towards the military site. As he enters the bunker, a voice declares Miracle Man a communist puppet. Even as Archer explains that while their last line of defense is not as powerful as the Miracle Man trio, he is rather strong. Miracle Man is then confronted by a man in bowler hat and skin-tight suit. Wielding an umbrella, he's a proper British hero, Big Ben. 
It's explained to Big Ben that this is Major Molotov, sent by the Kremlin to steal the bunker's new death ray. He unleashes a torrent of violence on the somewhat befuddled Miracle Man, who simply ignores most of it. Liz, now very pregnant, is trying to complete a piece of art, but her heart isn't into it. Mike isn't home. The baby hasn't kicked yet. It's Miracle Man's child. What if it has powers? What if it's deformed? Frustrated by his opponent's lack of presence in their fight, Big Ben demands he fight back. Miracle Man swats him away like a fly, landing at Cream's feet, while the agent follows Miracle Man from a safe distance. They reunite at the bunker's door, which he promptly rips open. The bunker is filled with... uh... stuff? Well, hey everyone, welcome to the bunker tour. I'm your god, Brian. Please stay with the group at all times, and please, no touching any of the artifacts. I'm looking at you, you little brats. <laughs> Now on your left is the alien skeleton of a quasi-dimensional traveler that washed up on the shores of this dimension some 30 years ago. Fun fact, its death scream liquidated the brains of everyone within a 10 mile radius. And what's this on our right? Well, it's just my favorite part of the tour, our new water fountain! <laughs> Sir Dennis arrives much later, the bunker having been destroyed. They comb through security tapes to see what set off the usually serene superhuman, Studying the alien corpses, the spook show found a way to grow two bodies at the same time, with one stored in an alternate dimension. They created three test subjects out of orphaned children of dead Air Force personnel. Miracle Man then sees a tape on the creation of Big Bend, a flawed, weaker clone with inferior mental programming, making him extremely susceptible to suggestion. Both men unaware that Ben is back and seeing his own origin. We then get Miracle Man's origin, the strange astrophysicist and all of his comic book adventures were mental conditioning, a way to make him a benevolent protector of mankind as they run through various scenarios in a computer simulation. All of this designed by the head of Project Zarathustra, Dr. Emil Gargunza, Miracle Man's arch enemy. He snaps at this and destroys the monitor bank. He and Cream eventually leave, a broken Big Ben left behind. Fortunately, his teammates Jack Ketch and Owl Woman take him to get help freeing his mind from the communist mind control. But in reality, doctors throw a straitjacket on Ben and feed his broken mind another lie he can believe. And the biggest of those lies? That anyone besides John Steed can save the world in a bowler hat while carrying an umbrella. Well, there we have it. The origin of Miracle Man, formerly Marvel Man, based on Shazam, formerly Captain Marvel. It's the start of a legendary comic book run by a legendary writer with a couple of legendary artists. But I don't want to oversell it. Maybe it actually sucked. Or maybe it was a miracle, the perfect comic book that no one could find fault in. Let's take a closer look at the first 12 chapters, or three issues, of Miracle Man. First, let's talk about the art. The realistic, raw style of Gary Leach serves the first part of the book especially well. Along with the colors by Steve Olaf, the images really pop. The kid Miracle Man scenes where he's bathed in a green light and looking psychotic are especially powerful. Unfortunately, Gary Leach, who recently passed away, couldn't maintain the art needed for the book's publishing schedule, so the latter parts of the story were drawn by comic book superstar Alan Davis of Excalibur fame. He definitely knows what he's doing, but my only complaint about the look of this book was Big Ben. Why does his outfit look like it's a skin-tight suit? Unless for some reason it was a skin-tight superhero outfit that was made to look like traditional British business attire. Still, it's an odd aesthetic art aside, we're here for the story, and while this isn't the most famous Miracle Man story, that would be Kid Miracle Man's return, it is his origin story. Now, I should warn you, modern audiences might not be familiar with this style of comic book. If you've never read a comic printed before 2010, it can be a bit of a rush. Let me explain. Back in the day, comic book writers liked to write, and boy howdy, did they. So in this 1980s comic, you're going to do a lot of reading. Modern comic book creators follow the show-don't-tell rule. 80s comic book writers did both. They showed you what was happening and told you at the same time, with conventions like dialogue boxes. In fact, Alan Moore avoids using thought balloons, he was something of a visionary in that way, and instead uses third-party narration to describe what the characters are thinking. It's very easy to look at Miracle Man and dismissively say, oh, it's just an edgy Shazam story. But really, this is one of the first deconstructionist superhero titles, something we'd see a lot of in later books like Astro City and Moore's Watchmen. He shows us the early fun version of the superhero comic with the opening chapter. Then he takes it and shows us just how utterly destructive a superhero battle would be. It's all fun and games for kids who become adults until one of them stays an adult forever, and another is being driven mad by his inferiority complex because his other self is perfect. Moore really dives into this in the post-Kid Miracle Man chapters. Those first four? 
Well, that was just straight-up action from the get-go, to set up the Miracle Man idea and draw on readers with a ton of that trendy violence. It's really the later chapters where Moore starts to unpack all of his ideas and lay them out for us. Sure, there's still plenty of action, but it's liberally dosed in suspense. Things like Cream killing a witness he promised to spare, or controlling Mike with a baby's potential death. It takes what should be a fun, consequence-free lifestyle and piles it on top of Mike to the point he can't breathe. Liz is pregnant by his younger, perfect self. Miracle Man is a god among men. He can barely hold a job. That goofy enemy he never took seriously? Whoops! He created me and my friends and was manipulating us all along. War just takes the idea of an innocent superhero and ups the powers, responsibility, and the stakes to the nth degree. It really was something new and unheard of at the time, but it's since inspired plenty of copycats in the modern era. Billy's fate in Kingdom Come feels very reminiscent of Miracle Man. That said, Miracle Man was a product of his times. And because of that, the book can feel a bit dated at times. So ultimately, I feel Alan Moore created a very compelling story, a mystery that slowly unravels as the hero is playing for stakes that could destroy the world. I give Miracle Man a dream of flying four out of five stars. It loses a point for the aforementioned dated feel, and it can be a bit heavy on the reading when it doesn't need to be. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this review, and knowing any time I gain new viewers, I can say, it's a miracle, man. This has been Comic Book Issues, and I'm your host, Brian Hines.